can you tell us where we are and what is this conference about? Thank you. You're in the beautiful city of Haarlem, in the Philharmonie building, at the fifth edition of the Interdisciplinary Conference on Psychedelic Research. What is the reason why you organize this conference? Main reason is really to get people together, to get everybody who's interested in, in scientific research and therapeutic applications of psychedelics in the same room. But there are you know, people involved in the business side as well. There are therapists, there are students. The main reason really is, I think, to get people together, but also to just showcase everything that's happening in the, in the world of science and as well to have a critical discussion about the directions this field is headed in. Last time this conference was organized, it was 2016. What happened since then? I mean, a lot of things happened. Can you highlight some of the big changes in this field? Yeah, it's unrecognizable almost. We, d we did do another conference in 2020, by the way, but it was virtual. It was supposed to happen here. So we postponed it for two, uh, two years to be able to do it in person. But yeah, the changes have been enormous. So since 2016, Michael Pollan's book came out, uh, which has recently been made into a Netflix documentary, which means that there's a lot more interest in psychedelics. Like people who had never heard of it before, they see this documentary, they read his book, and they become interested and curious what this is all about. And at the same time, interest from businesses has, has, has sparked enormously as well. So we had a presentation yesterday, which estimated that the total market on psychedelics is about 4 billion now, which is super tiny compared to big pharma, but for where this field is coming from, with very small studies funded by philanthropists, small organizations, it's a, it's a, it's a sea change. So there is this big hype around psychedelics now. What is the response from the scientific community to this big hype and expectations? Mostly scientists are enthusiastic, they're curious, they're interested to, to, to learn what this is all about. And the same for, the, for, for clinicians. So many of the people I, I know that have recently started researching psychedelics became interested precisely because you know, there's a sub, subgroup of the patients they treat that don't respond to the conventional treatments. So they're interested in exploring new treatments. And if you look at the science, if you look at the data, then they see, okay, there's something there, there's potential there. I mean, the data don't lie. And that's ultimately what convinces people. Why do psychedelics have so much potential in, in treating different kinds of mental health disorders? Yeah, that's a million dollar question. Why, why do they work and, and for whom do they work exactly? So I don't, I don't think we entirely know. I think it's a very useful metaphor is that it helps people get to the core of their issues and to, to shake loose some of their rigid, rigid patterns, which is something that traditional pharmacotherapy at least doesn't do. It, it usually alleviates people's symptoms. It, it, it dulls some of their complaints, but it doesn't really address the core issue that people, uh, that people struggle with. And that's something that, that psychedelics uh, or psychedelic assisted therapies, I should say, uh, have the potential to address, to really go below the surface and to see what, what, is, what is it that troubles people most. Do you think psychedelics will replace or supplement existing treatments? No, no, they, they will supplement treatments. It will be, it will be another step in the, in the whole treatment path. And exactly where they land, do they come, you know, in the case of depression, for example, do people still, in the end, do antidepressant treatment and psychotherapy first, and then ketamine treatment and then classic psychedelic treatment? And where, where it ends up in the trajectory is, is, a, is a major question that we don't know yet, but it will definitely not replace any of the existing treatments. Also because they work well for people and not everybody will respond well to psychedelics. Do you see any, any risks of, of having these high expectations and, and big hype? Yeah, big risks. I'm a little hesitant and it's interesting because we've been doing this for 15 years and in the beginning my, my role was kind of making people enthusiastic about psychedelics and getting them interested in the subject and now my role is much more, you know, warning people that not everything will uh, will stay as good as it looks now. There will be people who, who who won't respond well. There will be adverse events, and especially because of this, you know, grown media interest. If you look at the Michael Pollan series, for example, there is one example, one one case of a of a patient with OCD who had a very profound experience. It was a, it was a very beautiful story. It was it was emotional, but that was the story that was presented. There was no other patient who didn't respond well, who had a very negative experience or who had negative uh, effects after the treatment was over. 
And those cases are also there. So if you don't present both sides, you, you, I don't think you paint a, you paint a fair picture. And that's, that, that sets wrong expectations and having high expectations can only lead to disappointment. Do you think there is a danger that there will be a backlash after this current uh, renaissance of psychedelic studies? A little bit. Yeah, the, 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 the positive side is that, that most of the uh, groups doing research are doing really solid research. So there's solid methodologies. I mean, there are obviously caveats because there are psychedelics and you can't probably, properly control for placebo effects because people notice that, they, um, that they're on a psychedelic. But for the most part, people are doing serious science. The other side of it is, I think there will be a kind of backlash in the sense that the, um, the attention won't be as positive. So there will be negative, negative attention. People will highlight the, the um, negative aspects a little more. Yeah, this is a moment where a backlash could happen. And especially because, you know, if, if, if you see the trajectory of attention, it's all positive, 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 and it's not going to continue being positive, right? There will be, there will be an incident, a highly publicized uh, case, as you, had, as you saw in the, in the MAPS trial where somebody, um, a patient uh, was seriously abused. Uh, there were sexual transgressions between the therapist and the patient, and this was widely publicized. And this, this will and can happen again, unfortunately. In that sense, I do expect that there will be a, a cooling down of the, of the hype, which I think is a positive thing as well. Can you explain what's the situation in, in the Netherlands? How psychedelics, the use of psychedelics is, is, is regulated or it remains unregulated? Yeah, the, so the interesting thing is we have truffles containing psilocybin, which are sold openly in, in smart shops, which are completely unregulated. It's, it's part of the same organism as the, as the mushroom, which is the fruiting body of the same uh, species, which is in list two of our Opium Act. And then the, the active ingredients, psilocybin and psilocin, they are in list one of the Opium Act. So the same substance, depending on the form that it comes in, is scheduled differently. But we do have a, a relatively rich landscape of, of retreat centers offering uh, psilocybin ceremonies, guided, guided psilocybin ceremonies on the one hand. And then on the, on the more scientific clinical side, we have research happening at universities across the country. So there's different kinds of research happening in different, uh, different universities. And that's, that's really becoming uh, uh, much more visible now as well. Do you think psychedelics have a place outside of, of the medical realm? Is there a place for, for recreational use of psychedelics? Yeah, I mean, even, even the word recreational, I think, is, is, is wrong. It's, it's always put opposite medical use, but medical is one, and that's, that's, I think, for me, that's what makes psychedelics so, so interesting. Medical applications, this is, we're, we're trying to fit something very intangible and sometimes ineffable, so hard to put into words, into a medical therapeutic model. But there are, if you look at how psychedelics have been used and are used traditionally in, in indigenous cultures, there are many different reasons why people take psychedelics. Sometimes it's for initiation rites, it's for uh, religious purposes. In the, in the case of the Santo Daime, the, the uh, Barquinha churches, there's personal growth, there's exploration, there's recreational use. And I think they're all equally legitimate. So I think there should be always be a plural approach to, to psychedelics. And medicalizing psychedelics shouldn't necessarily mean that all of the other um, reasons for, for people using psychedelics should be put aside. Yep. A lot of people are concerned that these substances have been used for thousands of years in a specific cultural and traditional context. And now they are taken out from this context. How will this work out? Uh, that's an, it's, a, it's an interesting question. I mean, we have our own, we have our own, obviously our own cultural context, right? So you cannot, you cannot transplant um, ayahuasca ceremonies onto the Dutch healthcare system. We have, a, we have a different cosmology, a different way of understanding the world, a different language, a different uh, understanding of what is health or what is mental health or what is individual communal health. So I think it's really about finding ways of using, using these substances that make sense in our belief system, in, in, our, in our cultural perspective. And that's, I think, one of the main challenges. How do you see the future of psychedelics? So how do you see the, the future role of psychedelic studies and therapy? So this is something that we're actively working on. So we're trying to shape 
um, the discussion, at least in the Netherlands, um, where we're bringing together stakeholders from all the different elements in the in the healthcare system together to try and preempt uh, what will happen in a few years, which is that the first psychedelics will become registered in Europe and also in the Netherlands to make sure that healthcare insurers, governmental bodies, regulatory agencies, professional associations of psychiatrists, clinical psychologists, university medical centers, mental health institutes, everybody who has some stake in this, uh, in this field gets together and we're trying to really shape how they will eventually land in the, in the mental care, mental health care infrastructure. And that's, that's, I think, our main challenge. And if we accomplish that, if we find a model to do that, that is reimbursed by healthcare insurers, that will lead to safe and effective and ethical treatments. And we keep following patients over a long period of time. So we really understand how they're doing also two, three, five years from now. I think then we've set an example for the, for the rest of the world. And that is, that is our current ambition. <laughs>